Ni Han Yang, hello, I am the Dark Fae and welcome back to Confessions of a First Time Dungeon Master. As always, if you missed the last session or need a refresher on what happened, I will put the link up to that in this corner below. But um, let's get started. Funny thing happened when I went to go prep for this session. Um, I like messed up my like neck and my back and I was just in like a lot of pain on um, the day before the session when I was gonna prep as well as during the session, but basically what ended up happening is I didn't prep for this session. Um, but literally, like, the only thing I did was for kind of, like, later on, I, like, found um, a layout of, like, the house that they get in This Is Grain Keep, and then the only event that I, like, planned was going to happen was that if they went back to Flurnissa, this swamp city, there would be a funeral going on for the woman who had helped them find um, the path to the Swamp Keepers. So that was literally the only thing that I prepped that I knew was happening. And I didn't, like normally when I prep, I kind of imagine the scenario and kind of like how it can play out or like what kind of happens, but I didn't really do that for this. So I was making it up as I go along. And actually at the end of the session, I asked the players if, anything felt off or if like it seemed different than other sessions or if um you know it just kind of had a different feel but I don't think they really noticed which is pretty awesome um they seemed it was a good I actually felt really good at the end of the session too like it felt productive and like a good pace and it seems felt like everyone kind of had a role or was like doing something um that their characters would do so that was actually really awesome so not saying that I'm like not gonna prep from now on, but I think this is kind of a sign that I'm getting a little bit more comfortable with being a DM, and this is session 16, so uh, I guess I'm making some progress. Um, and I think it kind of was able to do this because I'd already prepped so much for like the swamp as a whole that I kind of knew most of it, um, either unconsciously or like. Um, was able to kind of come up with things that had like a similar flavor or like a similar feel because I'd like been so invested in the swamp. But anyways, let's get started with the recap. I have a lot of notes because as I said, this is actually a really productive session. But um, so after figuring out kind of the, the timeline of where, of how long they've been in the swamp. Um, so we left off, they had just finished a long rest outside of the... Um, outside of like the swamp keepers lair kind of the, the entrance so there are no dancing lights for them to follow back so i do have them roll kind of like survival to see if they can find the path back um i kind of fast traveled this a little bit because the swamp travel is getting a little bit tedious um at some point like valkyrie she does take a wrong turn and then she kind of ends up a little bit stuck um i didn't do combat or anything like that because they do have an ongoing deal with the Swamp Keepers, and they're kind of protected as they leave. So, um, base, but basically they just kind of go off the path once, um, and they all roll pretty well in these like survival perception checks, so nothing really happens to them on their way back to this city. Um, so they reach Furnessa. Um, originally they were thinking to just kind of go directly to Ristmore, the little like Firbolg village that they left their horses at, but um, based off of geography in the map, uh, the fastest way is kind of to just cut through Flurnessa, so that's what they end up doing. So, only thing I prepped was they get to Flurnessa and basically they see that, like, a lot of people are, like, starting to congregate in, like, this center temple. Um, and so they kind of go and see what the commotion's about and they realize that... Mylis, who is the woman who helped them in the Labyrinth house to, um, who gave them the silver bell, she has died or been murdered, and she's now kind of going through a funeral rite, um, led by the leader of Thornissa, um, Lady Sidmira Moss. So she's kind of, um, going through this kind of funeral, and a lot of the townsfolk are gathered to kind of, um, give prayers to Melispa or send well wishes to kind of guide this soul like to its resting place um hopefully kind of like in the garden of melispa or what have you um and um they find out that she was found 
dad that morning in the Labradam house. And so, um, let's see. So, Valhiri, she kind of spots somebody near the front dressed in all black again morning, um, who kind of leaves the congregation after um, kind of giving his final words to the body. Um, there's like people kind of line up to um, pay their respects and give their final words. Um, Umerk gets in that line as Valkyrie kind of goes and follows this man outwards. Um, I think in the temple, Umerk and the others learn that that man is Milas's husband, um, but Valkyrie doesn't know that as she goes to search for him. Um, and so while she actually follows him back all the way to the Labyrinth House at the south edge of town, and so this is kind of, I had to like jump between because they split up kind of again. So while that was happening, um, Basil, Tehral, and um, Ivar, who are like our three stooges. Uh, side note that our wizard, Morgal, he's kind of taking a break. So I'm not really, that's why he doesn't really come up. Um, but our <laughs> kind of three stooges of the group, they kind of get tired of sitting around and then try to form like try like liven up the the atmosphere by holding like a beer and like mushroom eating contest so avar he like breaks into the tavern which is called the boggy brew and, like breaks down the door and like takes a keg of ale but he pays for it so two gold for the door two gold for the keg and two gold for like a service fee so at least he paid for it um so he does that and then Basil goes and hunts for mushrooms, and along the way he finds Valhiri. Like this is after Valhiri has kind of um, arrived at the Labyrinth House and is kind of like scouted around, and um, she's found that the inside of the house is pretty much empty except for uh, this man who has gone inside, basically. Um, and so, like briefly, as she heads towards the entrance, Basil finds her and enlists her help in looking for mushrooms and so she turns into a travel pig and rolls to find some mushrooms and like sure you can find some like chanterelle kind of type mushrooms um like near i forget in the i think like east of their the labyrinth house so basil does that like dropping more mushrooms as he's collecting and then Tehral kind of helps them make a stand. He like takes the door or something, puts it on a stump, and I don't know, they're starting to like try to bring people over from, who have like left the, the funeral. And so while this is going on, Umrik, he's kind of in line and as he kind of reaches um, like the front, he kind of steps aside to talk to Samira Moss and basically tells her that um, as a cleric of Aremsia, he can kind of perform some rites or some rituals to kind of maybe help find out what happened to her, and he's hinting at um, Speak With Dead. And uh, Senator Mas, who is not a stranger to, like, clerics of other deities necessarily, she um, agrees to allow him to try if, but like not now in front of like everybody's and maybe they will take when they take the body to the grave tree to be buried which i came up with on the spot um then like she'll allow him to like accompany them and like do whatever he needs to do to find out more um and maybe with only like a few select people like her her son who's kind of the second in command of the city as well as um some members of the nettle tribe the warriors so that's going on so then Everything kind of resolves a little bit um, with Valkyrie as she's, she decides to enter the house. She kind of goes around the back to the garden, um, enters through the, the, through the sunroom into the back door. Basically, she sees in the living room this man um, kind of just not kneeling down in the middle of the living room, just like scrubbing a very large blood stain off of the floor and walls. Um, so she kind of engages in conversation with him um and this man he's like this uh he's Milas's husband and so he's he's become like very resigned and kind of bitter he's lost his wife 
um, he's lost, he, he's lost his family, basically, he's lost his, any reputation, um, with the city, so he kind of has nothing, so he's kind of very open to answer any of her questions. Um, basically, she, she learns that, um, Mylis was his wife, his name is Gorian, um, Gorian Labernum, and that, like, his family, they, like, revered the Marsh Keepers, and, um, Valhiri also finds, like, lots of bits of, like, herbology and, like, um, not, like, a meth lab necessarily, but essentially, like, a lot of those, like, cauldrons and tools and vials and things like that for brewing some sort of substance, and they get the sense that this family helped to make the poison for the Marsh Keepers and, like, distribute it, sort of, or at least, or at least make the poison. Um, and then I think she also learns that, oh, she also learns that, like, the members of the Labyrinth family, um, they're the one, they, after they killed Milas, they all kind of fled, some of them, into the swamps to, like, just flee or maybe find a better life, or, and some of them have actually headed north up to the blasted keep that the Marsh Keepers kept talking about. This is Grayan Keep possibly for some kind of attack. Um, so that's a note of alarm and something I did not plan on having, so that might end up being something to prep for next time, but um, okay. So after th that, learning all of that, um, they all gather together for um, Milas' like, kind of final burial. So they take, so the leader, Samira Moss, she takes um, she kind of uses her staff and her magics to kind of, uh, form, like, a cocoon of, like, leaves and vines and flowers kind of around, um, Miles' body, and they lift her and carry her west, I believe, west to the grave tree, which is where this, like, grove at the base of, like, a large, like, ancient tree where they bury their dead, and this is actually another place where soul bells grow. Um, but these they don't harvest out of respect. So, um, as they kind of lay her at the base of the tree, um, she kind of pulls back the, the vines and flowers, like, from the face so that Umrik can do his thing, and Umrik does his thing. So, um, he casts Speak with Dead, and I've never gotten to roleplay Speak with Dead before, so that was pretty cool. Um, the spell basically allows you five questions to speak with to ask the dead person, um, and they, like, can't comprehend anything new, like, they can only know what they knew in life, they can't, like, um, speculate on, like, future events or anything like that, so that's kind of a limiting factor. Um, the spell also says that, like, the soul doesn't return to the body, but it's just, like, an animating spirit, but I kind of wanted to give them something a little bit more, and I kind of thought, like, to hell with that, I'm gonna roleplay it how I feel like it should be roleplayed. Um, so five questions he asked basically. Oh, sorry, another thing Valhiri learns is that um, the reason why Mylis gave them the bell and like betrayed her family is because they did something that she just could not condone. And so Gorian he reveals that he and Mylis they had a child and that they lost that died and she could not condone the kidnapping like of another child and hints very strongly saying that he has like a tail and like furry kind of furry and hints very strongly that this is Havian Charlie's brother so they learned that the Labradums did in fact take or kidnap Havian and basically, um, was it, he was given to the Marsh Keepers. So, now that they're talking to Mylis, or Umrik is speaking with Mylis's dead, dead self, um, he asks a few things. Like, what, what the ritual was that they did to, like, sacrifice a child. And the thing is, there is no ritual. So she answers that, 
there was no ritual. Um, and she talks in this very kind of like whispery voice. I'm going to describe it because I'm... So basically, like, as he casts the spell, these, like, necromantic energies kind of form around her, and then they kind of all gather and, like, um, and, like, swirl into kind of, like, the the open jaw, and, and, like, she takes a breath, and these, like, kind of, this kind of cold stare, uh, is now, like, lit, or this cold, like, light is kind of in her eyes, like, not quite alive, but at least present. Um, and so every time she speaks, the breath kind of like rattles in and then is like forcefully expelled outwards. She basically tells them that um, there was no ritual sacrifice. They kept the prisoners and waited for the marsh keepers to come for them. So that was like the first question. I might be out of order, but second question he asked was what were the f like f her what were the family's, like, plans, um, against, like, the keep, or, like, what are they planning to do, but this, like, what, um, what the Labradum family ended up doing, like, deciding, uh, with, like, fleeing or going to the keep, that was decided after they murdered her, um, they decided that they couldn't stay here any longer, and that they had to do something and like the fear of being caught by like this other party um kind of forced them out so she doesn't know of her family's plans and tells them such um they also ask if there is a safe house of any kind for the family like in the swamp or elsewhere which there is not they don't have like a second abode they don't have somewhere to kind of lay low um everyone in this in Flornessa or like the marshes is, or is very like a tight knit and it's rare for a tribe to kind of go off on their own if they've already like if they've been a part of Flornessa like yeah so the tribes can be separated like originally but if they're already part of the whole they don't usually break off unless something happens like no um and then so that was the fourth question and the last question this is where i kind of was like i screwed i'm gonna rp whatever um they asked if there was like any unfinished unfinished business that she had that they could help take care of um and basically this is kind of where i get put it in play that she her conscience kind of came came to um that that uh she revealed that there is an antidote to this poison um that can be administered that the family has um and then with that the necromantic energies kind of exhale back out of the body and she lies still um sin miriam moss and the others are very just like kind of stunned to hear that this has happened within their city um they kind of proceed with the burial and um the party kind of works out with Galamede and Sinmira's son to kind of keep a tighter watch over the city, look out for um, the marsh keepers as they are now like decidedly not like a force of good within the swamp, um, and to also keep an eye out for any of the Labradum family members who might return. Um, so, after finishing that burial and um, returning to the main city, um, they go and visit Gorian again at the house. Um, he writes down the antidote recipe for them while they're kind of searching around. Um, there are, see, Basil looks for magic items in the house. There aren't any, but he does find kind of pieces of a rope outside, um, near one of, like, the garden statues that has a faint sense of transmutation. Um, they don't pick it up and they don't know what it is, but it's pieces of a rope of entanglement that was used to tie their prisoners up. And so, um, let's see, Basil kind of convinces Gorian to join them or to come along with them to the Siskoyan Keeps that maybe he can help, um, help, like, neutralize what their family is doing or help kind of with the um, the poison that's already been spread throughout the city. Um, he reluctantly agrees, and while he does so, he gets a whisper in his head that I, 
uh, message to him privately that um, he hears a whisper in his head that's, that says he deserves death, kill him. Um, there's no compulsion to do so yet, but um, basically just a voice. And then he asks if Ivar can hear it because he and Ivar are telepathically connected, but Ivar cannot. And uh, he tries to ask, like, who's there, but he's just met with laughter in return. So that was a fun little secret tidbit. And then, uh, let's see. So they, they end up spending the night at the Labyrinth House to avoid paying in fees, because why not? Um, Gorion doesn't really care about life anymore, so what? there's more than enough room. Why the hell not? Okay, so now they go back to Ristmore, and upon like learning what they have now about Havian, they presume that he is dead, as he has been taken by these swamp keepers. So, DM insight here. Um, if they had decided to kind of confront the Swamp Keepers the first time and start combat, um, they might not have necessarily had like enough cause to, but if they wanted to, they just decided like, we don't want to waste time with this, we just want to kill them and be done with it. Um, they would have found Havian like in there, the Swamp Keeper is like abode, alive, um, tied up, but fine. Um, if they had, like upon learning this, if they had decided to immediately go back into the swamp and try to find and return to the Swamp Keeper's abode and like either try to, I don't know, bargain for him or fight the Swamp Keepers and say and rescue Havian, they could have. He was still alive at that point. But they've decided then to continue on to Ristmore and return back to the Siskorian Keep in order to like fulfill their bargain or plan what to do next, basically, because I don't think they really want to necessarily fulfill the bargain after learning like what kind of evil is going on behind the Swamp Keepers. But because of that, Havian is like by the time they get there and come back, Havian will be dead. Um because He's going to be fed to their pets. So now that they go to Ristmore, um, who is kind of awaiting news if they've heard anything of Havian, and now they have to explain to them that he is, he has been taken and is probably not coming back and is, well, at this point, he's not dead, but they presume that he is. So, Chari, who is an adorable seven-year-old fearbog, um, they don't, they kind of discuss how to kind of break it to her. Um, they decide that, like, Basil is going to be <laughs> the spokesperson, and he does a thing where he, like, he first uses, like, magic mouth on, like, a piece of parchment to say that, so your grandson's dead, and etc., and stuff about, like, taken by the Swamp Keepers and they should watch out. Uh, but Tayrell, he leads Chari aside um, to kind of talk to her so that Basil can talk to the grandmother. Um, and Tayrell was actually very tactful with Chari. Um, he was, he just opened with saying, like, um, so you know Havian, like, he's always thinking of you and your family. He loves you very much, but he can't like, come back right now, basically. Um, and Chari, who has very strong familial ties, everyone in this village does, doesn't quite understand, of course. She's a little confused as to why her brother can't come back. Um, basically, her own very, like, childlike, like, reasoning, she says, um, she basically says, oh, I bet the Havian, he's, he's probably got, like, a secret girlfriend, right? And that's why he's not coming back. He wants us to keep it a secret, basically. Um, that's what she thinks. And she's, um, and Tara just kind of goes with it and says, like, you know how it is, even though she doesn't. Um, so he might not be able to come back for a while. 
um, and she, she, so she kind of like, she's, thinks that she's kind of like in the know. She's like, oh, okay, I got this. I promise to keep it a secret. Um, and so that's kind of how he explains that Havian is not coming back. Um, and so with Basil and the grandmother, he explains that, he explains the truth that Havian was taken by the Labyrinth family and um, kind of sacrificed or given to the Marsh Keepers and that he's probably um, past saving, probably dead, and um, that they're very sorry, basically. And so the grandmother is just, just kind of, um, she, she's usually like a pretty like lively woman for being such like an old furbolg, furbolg, but, um, the news kind of like visibly ages her and she kind of can barely, barely support herself as she kind of just like crumples and she, um, goes to kind of tell, tell, um, tell Havian and Charlie's parents basically and figure out what to say to Chari. Um, so that was actually a super sad moment. Um, but it, it's how it happens. Um, so in addition to kind of telling them the news about Havian, he, Basil also mentions like to be wary of the Slum Keepers and also gives them the antidote recipe just in case. So, um, they, I believe, um, go and grab their horses and then ride off for the Siskoyan Keep. And that is where we ended the episode. So it was, I th felt really good at the end of the episode. I had like no gripes. I felt like they learned a lot. They got a lot of like good RP in and, um, like they had some, some cool moments where they could like flex on their on their skills with um either like stealthing or or finding things or speaking with the dead and some kind of sad actually emotional moments where um uh things could have been could have been different but um it'll i think it'll work out in the end um so now for next session a lot to prep for what's happened back in the Siskorian Keep, um, a lot with like Fernay, and now they kind of have to decide what they want to do with this deal that they made of, of, of meeting with the Viscount, which doesn't seem very plausible, um, as well as kind of wrapping up with the Labyrinth family and whether they can catch them in time, because they do have like poison bombs that they can affect the city with. Um, and then the Church of Trin is on fire because Miss... Oh, very important point I forgot to mention. Um, I think before they slept, um, Umrick sends a couple of messages. One to Lady Germain, and this is Grand Keep, the apothecary. He tells her the antidote recipe, which is a really good thing because he then sends a message to Fernay that, um... Um, what did he say to Fernay? Uh, basically kind of explaining their status and that they would be coming back. Um, and basically she gives them an update that, uh, good thing they found an antidote because the poisoned guy popped and the church is aflame. So they're gonna find out what happened to Mescor when they get back. Um, yeah, so a lot of things to kind of, uh, figure out and introduce and wrap up, and then I'll see what they want to do about the Swamp Keepers. Um, because if they don't arrive, like, bring the Viscount to them, there's gonna be consequences. But if they do bring the Viscount to them, he's probably gonna die. Because <laughs> these are not nice people but that will be for next time which is actually tomorrow but when i upload this it'll probably have already happened
So anyways, thank you so much for watching. Hope you're enjoying following along with this campaign. Leave a comment down below if you've ever had a sad moment in D&D where um, that actually was pretty emotional as the DM or as a player. I don't know. But anyways, thank you all for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye! Thank you.